Good morning, everyone. Today, I want to look at the question of what is the gospel. But first, let me show you my cool little sign to let you know that we are now in business. Welcome to the Caffeinated Bible. My name is David Paris, and I've been teaching seminary for the past 20 or 30 years in the U.S. and around the world. The goal of this channel is to take what I've been teaching and make it available to anyone on the internet anywhere. It shouldn't just be restricted to the 20 to 30 students that have the money and time to take one of my classes. So I promised that I would let you know who won the two books, Beginnings by Morna Hooker, after the 15th of January, 2023. So let me tell you who won the books. We have two winners, Anthony Woolman and M.E. Torrance. And I'll include my email in the show more section of this video. So send me an email telling me your address where I can mail these to. But here's why I chose these two people. Anthony writes, Hi David, ever since I've taken a course on the Synoptic Gospels, I've been fascinated by how they all tell their own unique stories, sometimes very different from each other. A significant part of what I learned was about the beginning of the gospel, how they introduce and identify Jesus. I would appreciate this book because it's not one that was referred to in the class, but I feel it would fit right in with my, and I think it goes on to say, studies there. And then Emmy Torrance I chose because they actually submitted two comments. And the second one reads, you made the genealogy much more clear, and that's referring to my last video, much more clear and interesting than just reading it. We are studying Matthew in our Sunday school. When I saw the notification that you were talking about the genealogy, I sent it to the priest presenting the study. I would love to have the book beginning by Morna Hooker. So Emmy Torrance, I am sending you a copy. So if you guys can send me an email to my email address below this video, I will get this book out to you. So what is a gospel? Well, on the one hand, we could say that it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John one of the four Gospels. But does that tell us what a Gospel is? Or is it just telling me the four books that go by that name? We could also say that a Gospel is a life of Christ. But do they really tell us about the life of Christ? It seems like they really focus on just the last three years of his life. And even then, about half of each Gospel really zeroes in on just the last seven days of his life. What hangs us up today is that we've got a New Testament, and we've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in it, and each one of them opens with the Gospel according to. So it really seems obvious to us about what they are. But what do we mean when we use the word Gospel? Well, let's answer the easy question first, right out of the gate. What does the word mean, and where does it come from? Let's go backward in time to answer this question. The English word gospel comes from the Anglo-Saxon word Godspell. Basically two words that were smashed together. God for good and spell for news. During the English Reformation in England, William Tyndale around 1525 originally translated the word as glad tidings in most instances, but in some he still preserved gospel. About 50 years later, when the Bishop's Bible was printed, the main translation was Gospel. Since these two translations form the backbone of about 90% of the King James Version, this is how most of our translations today translate the word. The English word, when they were translated, comes from the Latin Evangelium, which is a translation of the Greek. In other words, the Latin did not have a word, so they just took the Greek word, pronounced it similarly, and spelled it almost the same. It's sort of like the word Pokemon, which is a transliteration from the Japanese word, I'm going to have to read this carefully here because I'm going to butcher it anyways, Pakito Mansuta. And the Japanese here is really a transliteration of two English words, pocket monsters. So it goes from English to Japanese back to English in this sort of transliteration circle. But I digress. So the Latin Evangelium is a translation of the Greek euangelium. The two words in Greek were smashed together to create this, eu for good and angelos for message or messenger. It occurs both as a noun, good news, as a verb to bring good news or announce good news in the New Testament. 
However, by around 150 AD, after the four accounts of Jesus' life in the New Testament were written, the early church begins to refer to the four Gospels as the Evangelium the Euangelium Cata Matthean, the Euangelium Cata Marcus, so on. They talked about the four Gospels according to the different authors. And they probably take this from Mark 1.1, where it says, the beginning of the Gospel, Euangelium, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So now we know a little bit about the history of the Word. But what is a Gospel? First, they are not what we would call a biography or a history of the life of Jesus, at least not to how we view works like that today. When we think about historical information, we look for works that are chronologically accurate. We also think that the writer should be neutral or fair. But even a quick reading of any of the four Gospels will really show us that they are not written from a fair or balanced perspective. They're not neutral observers, and they let us know that one of their main reasons for writing is that you should be persuaded to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. John even tells us this outright. In John 20, 31, he says, But these are records that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He specifically lets us know that he is not a fair or neutral observer. He really wants to convince us about the life and, of Jesus and why we should believe in him. Let me use an analogy to try and explain the difference. Our view of a historical account of someone's life today can be compared to making a video recording of, let's say, a sporting event. It shows you the events in the order that they occurred in sort of an unbiased manner for that game. However, instead of being a video recording of a game, the Gospels are more like the post-game wrap-up show. Imagine watching the post-game wrap-up show of the recent World Cup final between France and Argentina. If you watch the French version of the post-game wrap-up show, they would want you to see how great the French team was, how they battled from a 2-0 deficit and came back to tie the Argentine team now, imagine going to Argentina and watching the post-game wrap-up show there. They would want you to see how great their star player Lionel Messi is, how he's one of the greatest players of all time. France would try and console the country, Argentina would try and celebrate. They would be very, very different, and you may even wonder if they both were talking about the same game. So the Gospels really don't compare to what we would call a historical work today. Nor are they biographies. If you read a biography today about someone, you would learn a great deal about most of their life. What shaped who they were, their education, family background, trials they went through, and their accomplishments. The Gospels, on the other hand, leave almost everything about Jesus' life out. Matthew and Luke tells us a little about his birth and early childhood, but all four focus on the final three years of his life after his baptism by John. And as I said earlier, they really focus on the last seven days of his life, the Passion Week. 100 years ago, the great German theologian Martin Kaler wrote that the Gospels were passion narratives with extended introductions. And I think that's a great way to see the overall structure of the Gospels. About half of each one of the Gospels really focuses on the last seven days of Jesus' life. So the Gospels really don't compare well to modern forms of historical or biographical literature. But how do they compare to works from the ancient world? Now, in ancient Greco-Roman culture and other cultures, they had stories of divine men. For example, in Greek literature, you have stories of this character named Asclepius. Asclepius starts out as the son of Apollos, who seduced a woman, but he's human. And he takes up the occupation of being a doctor, for which he is very, very skilled. But when Asclepius starts raising people from the dead, Hades accuses him of stealing his subjects. So he complains to Zeus, who then kills him with a lightning bolt. This angered the other gods, especially Apollos, whose son he was, so Zeus relents and resurrects Asclepius and makes him a semi-divine being. 
Now I'll throw this in just for free. Asclepius is often pictured with his staff entwined with a snake or two. This became a symbol for Asclepius and is called the caduceus. And even to this day, modern medical practices still use this symbol. Now these ancient stories of divine men are similar to the gospels in that they were not impartial, but they wanted to convince you to follow that particular person like Asclepius. But there's major differences between them as well. In the stories of these divine men, when they perform some sort of, let's say, miracle or healing, these stories are very, very embellished and highly detailed. For example, in the story of Apollonius of Tyana, another one of these divine men, there's the story of him raising a widow's only son from the dead, a lot like Jesus raising the widow of Nain's son. But in the account of Apollonius of Tyana doing this, the account goes on for several pages. It tells you about what he says, his disciples, his interaction with the woman, what he prays over this person. Now compare this with Luke's account in Luke 7, 11 through 17. It's only seven verses long. In fact, what's rather interesting in the Gospels is just how bare bones the Gospel records of Jesus' miracles are. In some instances, it just says they touched an individual and they were healed, or he said a word, or he laid hands on them, and boom, it was over. Very, very, very boiled down, bare bone accounts. So they really don't parallel directly with these stories of divine men that we see from the ancient world as well. So how do they compare to ancient biographies? Let's say, for example, Suetonius's Life of the Caesars. The Gospels are a bit closer to these. For example, these ancient biographies would often give omens about this person's life, their family history, or what they taught or said. Biographers in the ancient world would not recount the entire life of the person. Rather, they would jump right to the point where things start to get interesting. So, for example, with the life of an emperor, they would skip almost all of the early life of that individual and start with their ascension to the throne or to power. In this way, the Gospels are very, very similar. Matthew and Luke include a little bit about his birth and early life, but like Mark and John, they get right to the start of Jesus' ministry with his baptism by John the Baptist very, very quickly. Luke is perhaps the closest to an ancient biographer. He even opens his account of Jesus' life with a standard Greco-Roman sort of introduction. Luke chapter 1-4 through four reads, now, many have undertaken to compile an account of the first things that have been fulfilled among us, like the accounts passed on to us by those who were eyewitnesses and servants of the word from the beginning. So it seemed good to me as well, because I have followed all things carefully from the beginning, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know for certain the things that you were taught. However, they also differ from ancient biographies. Matthew, Mark, and John don't include the prefaces that Luke does, for example. The Gospels often differ from biographies because they don't focus on the character and the virtues of their hero, Jesus. In fact, they seem to go out of their way to raise questions about his virtues. For example, when they record for us that the Pharisees complain that Jesus eats with sinners, drunkards, and he hangs around with prostitutes. Rather, the Gospels focus on Jesus' divinity and his role in God's plan. Ancient biographies also share two other traits with the Gospels. First, they would organize the events of that person's life according to topic, themes, or other principles. They were not so concerned with the actual historical order of events like we are, but organized their accounts according to other principles. It's not that they weren't interested in history, they had other principles that they worked off of as well. Also, they didn't play willy-nilly with the facts of history. Some basic things they kept in order, others they thought they had freedom to reorganize. The Gospels are like this as well. Take Matthew. He organizes his Gospel around five cycles. These cycles consist of chapters on Jesus' teaching and then a couple chapters on Jesus' deeds word and deed. He wants us to see that Jesus is mighty in word and deed. 
and he repeats this cycle five times in his gospel, perhaps playing off the five books of Moses, the law. Now Matthew wants you to see that we have something greater than the law in the person of Jesus Christ. And this is why Matthew chapter 5 is so important. I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Second, ancient biographers believed that a person's words revealed more about that person's character than the author's comments could. So they would include what they called crei, or useful sayings from that person's life. These brief accounts of what a person said or did were useful to convey teachings and were often memorized and passed around within their communities. A great example of this is found in Matthew chapter 13, where we have a collection of eight of Jesus' parables about the kingdom of God in one chapter. Think of them as sort of pearls. These are the events that people witnessed of a person's life. And a crayon would be like an individual pearl. Maybe this one might be a parable, this might be a confrontation. The gospel authors then picked from all these sort of little sayings and teachings that were preserved and passed down in the church to put together their gospel account and they would organize them according to different principles. So in Matthew chapter 13, we get a string of eight parables that Matthew puts together to teach us about the kingdom of God. But notice how that chapter is organized around A, they are parables, and they are all parables about the kingdom of God. Now I've got another video, I'll link here or underneath here, where I explain how the early church went from these pearls to the actual written form of the gospel. But it's beyond the scope of this video to cover all that right now. We have a parable on the loose. Where to go? Everything's all preserved and protected of the life of Christ now. Now the gospel authors had all these events and stories and teachings from the life of Christ that they either witnessed or learned from others. It's sort of like the basket of pearls. And they picked and chose from those pearls and ordered them in their gospel to communicate to their churches. Finally, we need to consider biographical types of books found in the Hebrew Bible, because remember, most of these early disciples came out of a Jewish background. Now in the Old Testament, we have a few books that we can consider sort of ancient biographies. These would include Ruth, Esther, Daniel, Nehemiah, and Ezra. The Gospels are different from these works as well. For example, in these Jewish biographies, the focus is on how someone like Esther plays their role within a particular historical situation. The focus in the Gospels is not on the role that Jesus plays within a historical moment. Rather, it is how his life impacts and changes history, how he becomes the hub in which all of history revolves around. We also need to realize, going back to Greco-Roman biographies, that they would quote from other works to explain the life of their hero. But oftentimes they're writing about, let's say, Caesar, who occurred many, many years ago. And then let's say Cicero or Ovid or someone is writing about him. So they are after the life of that individual and then they would quote from them to explain that person's life. The Gospels, on the other hand, do not include quotes from later writers, let's say the Church Fathers, that are explaining a particular point on Jesus' life. Craig Keener feels that this is important because it shows that the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were written fairly early before we had church fathers or other writings commenting on the life of Christ. The Gospel authors, though, do quote from other works, but they quote from works that precede Jesus, the Hebrew Scriptures. However, instead of just interpreting the life of Jesus by citing Old Testament passages, the Gospel authors interpret the Old Testament from the perspective of Jesus' life and teachings. So what can we say that a gospel is? First, we need to understand the four gospels that we have in relationship to all these ancient works. When Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were written, they were not written in a literary vacuum, and they reflected on, used, and changed the literary styles that were around them during that time. 
Also, understanding these differences helps us to see how the Gospels are different, but also might share similar traits with those works. Second, we need to understand the Gospels in relationship to the early church. The Gospels were written to teach, inform, persuade, and convince their readers. In this sense, they are sort of like extended sermons on the life of Christ. And we need to realize that each author has their own agenda and theological themes that they want to communicate to their churches. This is important. Why? Because this is why they are so relevant to believers today. And why we read the gospel accounts, we are being taught and preached at by them. We are learning their theology of who Jesus was when we read their account. We learn why he should be worshiped and what it means to the lives of those who follow him today. This is why they are so relevant to our lives today and is why it's important to understand the types of books that they are so that we can better appreciate, interpret, and apply their teachings to our lives. Till we meet again, peace.